Um, it's always uh, one of the great fears when you're organizing these things that either no one will come or you've booked a room which is too small. And I think we've actually filled this room beautifully, so I think uh, we've done well. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Carrie Williamson to uh, introduce the lectures. And one reason for that was that actually they wouldn't have happened had Harry not been very positive about doing uh, the whole lecture series, and in particular having access to a little bit of funding <laughs> to do this. Okay, I'll hand over okay. to Harry. Thanks, Robin. So on behalf of the Department of Computer Science, we're very pleased to launch a, a new Turing lecture series. The year 2012 is a pretty special one for computer scientists. It marks the centenary of the birth of Alan Turing. Uh, he was born in uh, June 23, 1912, and died at the age of 41 in, in 1954. He was a giant in uh, computer science. He's viewed by many as the father of computer science, one who founded many of our fundamentals about what computation is, what intelligence is, what algorithms are. And over the course of this lecture series, over the next six months or so, you'll hear bits about his life and his contributions to computation. Uh, this is a year of celebration that's being marked by ACM with a gathering of 32 Turing Award recipients this summer uh, by several universities in the UK that are doing centennial uh, lecture series to honor the works of Alan Turing. Uh, celebrations worldwide and we're pleased that the U of C can be part of this as well. Uh, Turing is a name that our students see many times during the course of their undergrad program. They learn about Turing machines as an abstract model of computation. They're learning about Turing tests as a, a test of cognitive intelligence. And we also have something called the Turing Award, which is, uh, to a computer scientist, the closest thing to a Nobel Prize that you can get. And uh, it's, it's nice to have this lecture series launched. I'd like to thank uh, Robin Cockett and Richard Zack as the main drivers behind this. I'd like to thank the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Science for putting forth resources, time and money and energy to helping organize and advertise. And this is the first of about five lectures over the next uh, six months. So I'm glad we've got a great crowd, and I'll turn it over to our speaker for today. Well, I'd like to introduce Richard Zack. So Richard Zack is a uh, professor of philosophy, um, but he's also an accomplished logician and uh, a historian of mathematics and logic. Um, he, uh, his dissertation, uh, he, he did in Berkeley, and it was on Hilbert's finitism. And uh, in some ways, that's related to the story that he's now going to tell. Uh, so over to Richard Zack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Robin. Thank you for coming. Um, so um, welcome. Uh, I will give uh, give you a little bit of background about. Uh, Alan Turing, since this is the first talk, but I will mainly be talking about just one aspect of his work, and then the other um, lecturers in the series will talk about other aspects. Um, but first of all, here's Alan Matheson Turing, uh, recipient of the Order of the British Empire, fellow of the Royal Society, uh, studied mathematics at Cambridge, King's College to be precise, um, and as a fellow of King's College, wrote his first paper, which I will be telling you about today. It was called On Computable Numbers with an Application to the Entscheidungsproblem, published in the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society in 1937, but finished uh, in 1936. Um, after his um, fellowship at Cambridge, he went to Princeton for two years to study and work with Alonzo Church, one of the foremost uh, mathematicians and logicians of the time at the um, Institute of Advanced Study, uh, where he wrote a PhD thesis. Um, so he did um, also receive a PhD, then came back, um, again uh, worked at Cambridge for a while, um, attended seminars of the, um, of the uh, of philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein on the foundations of mathematics. Um, so Turing sometimes makes an appearance in Wittgenstein's writings, so this is for the philosophers, I guess. Uh, and then uh, when the uh, Second World War broke out, um, he was recruited to work at the top secret um, signal intelligence headquarters um, uh, at Bletchley Park, uh, where he was instrumental in breaking a number of German codes, specifically the Naval Enigma code. Right? The Enigma is a certain encryption machine that the Germans used 
uh, and they considered it unbreakable, but the Allies, um, and among them, Alan Turing, were able to actually break it. Um, there are a number of exciting movies about that, U571, about a commando unit that, um, that uh, um, captured a German uh, submarine and, and got a hold of that Enigma machine and so on. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of excitement, um, um, but Turing, of course, was working in Hut 8 uh, and was just doing math, <laughs> breaking codes. Um, he was also, at the time, right, so in order to break these codes, you had to be, um, you had to do a lot of math, of course, but you also uh, had to um, build certain electronic machines um, that would then um, work rapidly through a, a huge number of possibilities of poss possible combinations that had to be tested in order to, uh, to, to actually uh, break the code. Uh, and so he carried, uh, he, he, um, um, uh, he collected a, 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 a number of, uh, sort of, he collected some um, experience in designing um, digital, digital computers, um, which then after the war, uh, he applied in the design of some actual, some of the actual first um, multi-purpose stored program electronic computers. Uh, first, the um, automatic computing engine at the National Physical Laboratory, and uh, then a while later, he moved to um, Manchester um, to, to the Institute of Mathematics there, uh, and was involved in the design of the Manchester Mark I computer. At the same time, he was also continuing his work in uh, mathematical logic. Uh, he uh, started, uh, he wrote a paper, a, a well-known paper on artificial intelligence, uh, on computing intelligence, I believe, it was published in Mind, um, where he introduced the Turing test. Uh, he also, um, some say he founded mathematical biology by, um, by, by first being the first to, uh, to talk, to investigate mathematical ways of describing certain patterns of, uh, of plant formation. Um, and um, uh, um, we'll ho hopefully have a talk about that in the fall with lots of pretty pictures. Uh, he, was an open, uh, he was openly gay, and um, that resulted in 1952 in a uh, conviction for um, gross indecency. Um, so he was uh, con convicted for, uh, for being a homosexual, and his, he didn't really defend himself in the trial. He just said, I didn't do anything wrong, and I guess um, that is one of the reasons he's also considered a, um, a gay icon. Um, instead of going to prison, he chose chemical castration as punishment. Uh, and his conviction for homosexuality also meant the loss of his, um, uh, of his security clearance, so he couldn't, um, couldn't continue his work um, in code breaking at the time. He couldn't talk about uh, his work at Bletchley Park because of the Official Secrets Act. Uh, and so some say that these, t these um, factors together drove him sort of into depression and finally uh, to suicide in 1954. But um, some people also think that um, it was merely an accident that he, um, uh, that he, that he poisoned himself with cyanide while uh, doing some chemical experiments. Uh, and some have even conjectured that he was murdered because he knew so many things about allied secret stuff. <laughs> anyway, so this is sort of the, the nutshell of um, Turing's life and work. And I will just focus on that very first paper and it's important. Uh, then other people will talk about his, the other aspects of his work. 